Benjamin Gates, according to the 2007 movie National Treasure, is a treasure hunter. Now, if you're going to be a treasure hunter, there are a few things that you got to have. There are a few basics that you need. And the first thing that you have to do is you have to believe. Benjamin believes there's a treasure. An immense treasure that nobody has ever seen anything of this size. And he believes that the key to finding the treasure is tucked into different artifacts throughout our nation's history. He even believes there's a hidden map on the back of the Declaration of Independence. And you know, because he believes this, he decides to become the ultimate treasure hunter. the fact that his belief begins to make him take some action. He believes so strongly in this treasure, he goes on a lifelong quest to find it. He dedicates all of his resources, all of his time. He risks his life. He even does something slightly illegal. He steals the Declaration of Independence. All to find a treasure. And if you're really going to be a treasure hunter, let's be honest, you can believe and you can take action, but eventually you have to have some reward. And he does. That scene you just watched is him finding his treasure. It contains a wealth of history knowledge. It also contains a wealth of gold artifacts that is estimated to be, in the movie's account, $10 billion. How would you like to find that treasure? $10 billion. I don't know if I could ever spend it, but wouldn't it be fun to try? $10 billion. And in his mind, that reward was worth all the cost. Now hold that thought, because we'll be back to it. We, too, have been on a hunt, not necessarily a treasure hunt, not looking for some rich gold artifacts or not looking for some room filled with treasure. We are looking for the kingdom of God. We started this quest on Memorial Day, and last week we kind of took off as as Anthony delivered the the sermon about salt, but we're going to get back on our hunt this week. And we're going to be looking at parables. That's how we've been using our treasure map. We've been looking not at the artifacts of our nation's history. We've been looking at these parables that Jesus put into God's word that says the kingdom of heaven is like. And so we began to to look at these parables that are all found in Matthew, looking at the little clues that Jesus left behind to tell us how to find the kingdom. We looked at the parable of the ten virgins and we found out the kingdom is something we must prepare for. We looked at the kingdom of the the workers, and we found out that, well, the kingdom isn't going to be fair. It's built on the idea of grace. We looked at the parable of the two sons, and we found out the kingdom is all about this idea of repentance. You know, that's the one thing I still haven't told you is what the kingdom really is. Well, we have to wait until we find it, right? And so let's take a look at our next two clues. We're going to continue to, to look at these parables, and we're going to be kind of aggressive today, and we're going to try to take two parables in one sermon, but it fits real nicely because Jesus told their story together. So we're going to start the same way that we have started all these sermons. We're simply going to observe the story, which means we're going to read it. And this is what it says in Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then, his, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. So that's the story as Jesus tells it. He's telling a story about these two men that both kind of had something in common, but there was a little twist in each story. So let me help you understand the context that we're hearing these in, because it's important that we put this back in biblical times. This is kind of easier than some of the other things are, because because have you ever found something? Do we have any eBay addicts out here? Okay, I know we got these. Any yard sale addicts out there? Yeah. Have you ever been to a yard sale and you're stumbling through somebody somebody else's old junk and you find something that's worth a lot of money and they don't realize how much it's worth? And they have like a 50 cent price tag on it. And, you know, you can buy it and put it on eBay and sell it for like 50. How happy are you at that day at the yard sale? Oh, yeah, that's a good day. 
Unless, of course, you have a problem selling what you bought, then it just kind of doesn't matter. But, but these men end up finding a treasure. So both of these translate well to our culture. That being said, there's one thing we need to understand. Because, you see, in the first story, we see a man that does something that, well, let's face it, in our culture, we would kind of think that's underhanded. We would think he, he did something that he shouldn't do. Because, well, the man finds a buried treasure. Nothing wrong with that. Problem is, it's not on his property. And then so he reburies the treasure. Then he goes out and he tells no one. Doesn't breathe it to a soul. Because after all, if he goes and tells the owner there's a buried treasure on your property, what's the owner going to do? Yeah. Then he buys the property to get the treasure. <laughs> Smart man, right? Right? Now, what you need to know is while in our culture we see that as underhanded and maybe a little deceptive, treasure being buried on property was kind of commonplace in biblical times. They didn't have banks like we had them, and the banks they had were owned by the Roman government, and the Jewish people didn't trust the Roman government. So it's kind of like Granny Clampett's mattress. Everybody stuffed their money somewhere where they knew where it was and where it was safe. And sometimes people died and the money was still buried somewhere in the yard. They didn't tell anybody, and so we don't know who the money belonged to. You also need to know the man did nothing wrong as Jesus told the story. That's important that you know that because this man, he was only obligated to tell someone about the treasure, to tell the owner about the treasure if he was under contract to work for the owner and found the property mentioned. He was a slave to the owner. But neither one of these was mentioned, was it? It didn't say he was a slave. It didn't say he was a contractor. We don't know why he was on this man's property looking for anything. We don't know why he was digging a hole on somebody's property. But here's what we do know. According to Jesus' story, he really did nothing wrong. But you also need to know there was some risk. You see, he followed the law. He put the treasure back until he could buy the property. That is what the law said you had to do. If you found property, or if you found a treasure or something on the property that did not belong to you, you had to put it back until you owned the property. So he did that. Well, while he was getting the funds together, somebody else could have found it and stolen it. It also could have been truthful that this could happen because this was also commonplace in that culture that the current owner knew about the treasure and put the treasure there, hoping somebody would find it and then try to buy the property. And of course, then the owner would just remove the treasure and the man would just end up with the property. So, so all of this was the risk. So you need to understand this is the way real estate worked in biblical times. So Jesus is not encouraging us to go dig holes in somebody else's yard looking for treasure. And if we find it, don't tell them until we can steal it. That is not the purpose of this particular story. But what is the purpose is we're going to understand where is God in the story. And he's not specifically mentioned, but he is kind of assumed. He is the original owner of both the pearl and the property. But that kind of makes sense, right? Now, where it represents the kingdom here changes a little bit between what we have been looking at in this particular story because in the previous stories, what the kingdom was represented by was a wedding ceremony or a vineyard. These were places you go. Now, all of a sudden, the twist has come in because now we have the idea that it's a buried treasure or a pearl. Well, this is something that you have. This is a possession. This is something that's tangible. I can hold a treasure. I can hold a pearl. I don't have to guess that. It's not some occasion or event that I have going forward. It is actually a something. Now, that something is something that you have to have. You have to make it your possession. I need you to take out of this also that this is something that's findable. It wasn't something that was laying right out there. It wasn't something that was readily at the, at the fingers, but according to Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, this is what it describes. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been, clearly, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. You have to understand, Jesus, according to this parable, this, this kingdom, it's a findable thing. See, in the story of the merchant, he 
knew exactly what he was looking for. He was looking for pearls. But however, as we move forward in this, we find out that the, the kingdom of God, well, it's obtainable. Isn't it? Both men ended the story with what? The treasure and the pearl. Both men got exactly what they were after. Both men got it, but you need to understand that in this story, obtaining it took everything they had. In both stories, all they had was enough, but it took everything. That's interesting for us to know. Both men did indeed end up possessing that which they desired. That's important that we know. This kingdom of heaven is not something that's far-fetched out there. There isn't something that's way out there somewhere that I can never get enough of, that I can never attain, that I have to work all of my life. It's not the treadmill. You just keep walking and you get nowhere. This is something that's findable. This is something that's attainable. Because this is the kingdom. Where are we? Well, that's kind of obvious, right? Because we're, we're out of surprises here, right? If the owner, is, is, the owner is, is God and the pearl and the treasure is the kingdom, and obviously we are the ones, we are the buyers. We're the people that have been out there looking. We're the people that stumbled across the treasure in the, in the vacant lot. We're the one that found the pearl. That is us. And so that is where we come into this story. We're the purchasers of the kingdom. We're the ones trying to find and we're the ones trying to obtain. So let's identify some principles of the kingdom that we can take out of this as we try to figure out what the kingdom is. And the first thing you need to see is the kingdom is valuable. Both men easily saw what they have found as having value. You notice what's missing there? They didn't ever ask the question, is it really worth that much? Both of them, when they found it, they realized this is something that is valuable. Both men were willing to sell everything they had in order to get it. That's how valuable it is. Now, I want you to understand, make sure I say this, this is not teaching that you buy your way into the kingdom of heaven. I want to make sure you get that. There is no price tag, no monetary price tag you can put on the kingdom of heaven. It is not teaching that. However, it is reinforcing the idea that while it's a gift from God, it will cost me to follow. Jesus tells us this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life will forsake it. For my sake will find it. He tells us this in Matthew chapter 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. He tells us this in Matthew chapter 19, verse 29. And everyone who has left their houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much when they inherit eternal life. Paul tells us this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worthiness of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider, I consider them garbage that I may have gained Christ. You see, you can't buy it. It is a gift, but it'll cost. So that means if we're going to follow the kingdom of heaven, if we're going to find the kingdom of heaven, one thing you had better know, and that is you had better Consider the cost. I don't think we say this enough in church. I mean, we want to make sure we make salvation available to everybody, and it is. But somehow we have painted this Christian life as some you come forward, you get dunked in the tank, and you can go out and live in life any way you want. Understand, there's a cost to this. Jesus believed it. This is what he said in Luke chapter 14, verses 28 through 30. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. So we can take it from this particular parable. If you want to have the kingdom of God, if you want to possess the kingdom of God, understand it is a free gift, but you better consider the cost of making that gift part of your life. 
because it will have a cost to it. And so with that in mind, let's um, do some application of this story to mine and your life. And the first thing I want you to see is it does not matter how you found it. Say that again. It does not matter how you found it. You notice the two differences between the stories? One man just kind of happened upon his treasure. He wasn't looking for it. It doesn't say he was out digging for it. It doesn't say that he was out there just trying to do it. It just says he happened upon a treasure. I don't know, maybe the top of the treasure chest was sticking out the ground. Maybe he had a metal detector out there looking for I don't know what the man was doing, but it just happened upon it. And that's okay. If that's how you got here, that's okay. The merchant, on the other hand, well, this was a man that was actually seeking out his treasure. Now, he wasn't looking for this particular one, but he was looking for fine pearls. We need to remember this. How you got to this point does not matter. Your path to the kingdom of God is unimportant. The thing that is important is that you find it and that you obtain it. That's an application we need to understand. Here's the next thing is you have to decide the value. Did you see it? Each man had to decide what they discovered was worth, was worth to them. You see, seeing it is good, but each one had to decide what they were willing to sacrifice for it. See, seeing it was good, right? But if I just saw the treasure and the man opened it up, and I suppose he'd open up that chest and it was full of Confederate dollars. My guess is, if you know anything about Confederate dollars, they're not worth a whole bunch these days. My guess is he would probably just close the chest, rebury it, and forgot all about it. But you see, they had found it, and so they assigned a value to it. You have to sacrifice. It's your choice. See, finding is important. Knowing how to find the kingdom of God is important. The proper roadmap is good. Seeing the value is great. Knowing it's worth the cost is great. But you do realize something. Both men sold all of their possessions so they could get the item. Both men did exactly that. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. For man number one, this was not too bad of a decision because he, he gets to, to buy the field, right? And then after he buys the field, he gets to go back to the field and dig up the treasure. And so now he has the treasure and the field. And on the field, he could use the treasure to build a house and a white picket fence and 2.5 kids and the, the car and the driveway and all the things that we call the American dream. And I guess he would still have some treasure left over. And so to him, this comes out pretty good. Yeah, that's the way I want my Christian life to work. Think about the merchant. The merchant's about to have a going out of business sale because what is his business? Selling pearls. So to get this one fine pearl, it says he sold everything. You do realize what that means. That means he sold the business. He sold the merchandise. He sold his house. He sold his car. I guess his camel in this case. I don't know if he sold his 2.5 kids or not, but I don't have the slightest idea. But it says he sold everything just to have the pearl. And guess what? What's he got left? The pearl. And he can't go resell the pearl because if he resells the pearl, then the thing that he sold, all this stuff to get is no longer his. So you realize the men end up in two totally different situations. It's, just, it's not always going to be fair and even, but you do understand. It will be different costs for different people. And God may call you, when it says sell everything, your sell everything may not look like my sell everything. But the thing is, is what both of them were willing to give everything to obtain their treasure. That's important. Maybe you've read through these stories all these years and you never caught that fact before that both of them ended up with their treasure, but they both ended up in two very different situations. Don't forget that. It isn't always going to be the way that we think it is. But here's the deal. They made that decision alone. You know, that's what they didn't do. They didn't call a prayer meeting. 
They didn't call mom or dad to ask them, you think I should buy this? They didn't go consult with a counselor or a financial advisor. All by their little lonesomes, they decided, I want the treasure or the pearl, and I will do whatever it takes to get it. That's what Jesus is trying to convey in this story. Because that's what it takes to find the kingdom of heaven. So what next? Man, it would have been nice if Jesus would have continued this story. I think we need like five or six more verses added to the end because this isn't the way we tell stories. As a matter of fact, right after Jesus told the story, he just stopped. He ended kind of abruptly. He didn't sum up his story. He didn't make a nice, simple conclusion. He didn't tell us what happened next to either man. He didn't give us a happily ever after. We don't know anything else about it. See, how Jesus ended the story, the fact that, that he didn't tell us, and the man that bought the treasure in the field went on to build, make all millions of dollars, and the man that, that, opened, that bought the pearl decided to open up a museum so that everybody come and stare at it, and he charged admission so everybody he could get off. And he doesn't tell us how the men recouped the value out of it, and that's important. You know why? Because the ending is important because what came next is irrelevant. Because no matter what, these two men, they possess the kingdom of God. That's the point of the story. Where the kingdom of God leads you after that is kind of irrelevant as long as you maintain possession of it. That was Jesus' story. See, it's kind of summarized in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 through 27. Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their lives will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it do for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the Father's glory and with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what? They have done. And we read that verse and we start making the list of what I have done. And we want to start taking about, talking about church attendance and baptism. We want to talk about all these things that we do. And you realize that's not the have done. The have done is, do you have it? Have you yourself individually taken possession of the kingdom of God? Let's go back to Benjamin Gates. Have you believed there actually is a kingdom? Have you taken the necessary actions, the things that God has laid out in his word and says, this is how you go about following me? Have you done those? Are you continuing to follow? Are you looking forward to a reward in the future? Or are you looking forward to the rewards that you get each and every day from that life? You see, we go about this kingdom of God and we think we've got it all figured out because we think it's all in the future and it's all in the present. And so this is not a question I'm asking you. Will you at some point choose to follow God? Have you done this? Your decision, your choice. Both of these men went away happy because they left their situation, not with more than they came, but with the right thing in their life. And that is they're focused now on this possession, this treasure, this pearl, as Jesus called it, this kingdom of heaven. And that's what I want you to take into your holiday weekend. Because this is a yes or no question. If your answer is maybe, then understand your answer is no. All right, this is a yes or no question. Do you possess the kingdom of heaven? If you answered that question, no. Let me encourage you to start thinking about what it means to follow Christ, what it means to surrender your life. If you 
need to talk with somebody about that, we're going to do a time decision. You can come forward. I can talk with you. Or we can get an elder to sit down if you need have lots of questions, and we can go and sit and ponder the idea what it means to follow Christ. If you answered that question, yes, then I want to know how you're reinvesting what you got. I want you to consider, are you taking that which God has given you and put it back into a place where it can be used so that other people may again possess the kingdom of heaven? That's what this story is all about. And that's what your choice is all about. Nobody else can make it for you. Would you please stand? We're going to pray and then we're going to sing.